Good afternoon. I know it's after lunch, so uh, try to stay awake. Just kidding. Um, we're very fortunate this afternoon uh, to have a professional panel of very distinguished guests um, from the ticketing industry and very, various facets of sports and entertainment, some in the ticketing industry, some of the other businesses surrounding the ticketing industry. Um, so please uh, turn your cell phones off, turn them on silent, put them away. Um, and uh, please show some respect to our guests today. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce them. Uh, they're going to talk a little bit about their, uh, their backgrounds and the companies they work for. And then we'll go through a list of questions. And we'll go to about 2.30, 2.45. I know you watch your clocks. Uh, then we'll do a Q&A. Uh, just to remind you, this is being taped for our other campuses for Miami, Denver, and Charlotte. Um, and uh, so, again, please turn your cell phones off. So I'm going to first start off with Mr. Dan Archibald. Go ahead, Dan. Hi. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Johnson and Wales. I'm Dan Archibald. I'm from Boston, Mass. Uh, a little bit about my academic pedigree. I started in uh, arts and crafts. I was an American history major, pre-law at Boston College. Finished up there in 1999. Uh, promptly left and went to go work for Accenture, or then Anderson Consulting, for a few years. Found that remarkably humbling and had a great manager who said, you're great, you got a good attitude, but you need to go learn some of the vocational skills of business. Uh, then went into uh, pursue a, a master's degree in MBA at University of San Diego. And from there, uh, followed a bunch of Accenture alums to a then startup called Pacquiolan, uh, where I am now. Um, so in Pacquiolan, if you sat in on Maureen's session a little earlier, she uh, kind of stole some of my thunder on my personal pedigree there. I kind of came up there um, about 14 years ago working more in a services capacity as a project manager helping new customer installations and managing change from one ticketing system to another. Uh, then left after our acquisition from Ticketmaster, went to go work for a really cool startup called Choice Stream in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Then on to Major League Baseball Advanced Media for about five years after they had acquired Tickets.com. And then about four years ago, we kind of got the band back together at Pacquiol and about five or six friends uh, all came back to the company around the same time. Uh, and in my new role, I help Pacquiol and work primarily in the arena business and in the regional ticketing distribution business. So kind of everything outside of our core activities around performing arts and college athletics. So thank you very much for having me up here. This is a fantastic panel. Thank you, Dan. Next, please welcome Mr. Charlie Callahan. Hey guys. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, actually, Johnson & Wales alumni, class of 97, uh, was a uh, <laughs> marketing major. Um, left when I graduate, graduated uh, at Johnson & Wales, I joined ESPN. And I spent nearly 10 years at ESPN uh, working primarily in their marketing department. Uh, from there, I joined a uh, local marketing agency for about two years, and then from there, I started, uh, co-founded uh, Bright Spot Events. And we've been in business about, we're just starting our eighth year this April, and we are primarily in a event technology company for the sports and entertainment industry. Um, what that means is that we do a lot of event registration websites, event apps, uh, for VIP, B2B types of events. So as an example of something we may do, we just did the NFL owners meeting. So the NFL will invite about 1,000 people to attend a meeting where they, they'll talk about rule changes, vote on different things. Uh, and we did the, we'll do the event website where they can register their attendees, their guests, and we would do an app for them as well that gives them all their documents, contents, agendas, and schedules, and things like that. Uh, on the ticket side of thing, we do a lot of uh, B2B events where it's not necessarily ticket purchases, but what we do is uh, mobile tickets. So for example, NBC does their giant sales pitch called an upfront at Radio City Music Hall every year. They'll invite about five to 7,000 people. Once they register their attendance to go to this event, they get a mobile ticket on their phone. Once they have the ticket on their phone, my staff will go down there with our suite of software and scan all those tickets so we can track everybody who's actually coming to the event. Um, we take all that data, send it back to NBC Universal so they could have information on 
who was invited, who attended, and in cases of what they did when they were on site for some of these events as well. So it's really a, a kind of a data play, but also making it uh, user friendly for the uh, event attendees. Thanks, Charlie. Mm -hmm. uh, next, please welcome Mr. Michael Norton. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, thank you for being here. Lee, thank you for the invitation. Um, currently, I am the Director of National Accounts for a ticketing organization named Access, A-X-S. Um, we sell and service ticketing software for a majority of the AEG sports and entertainment venues across the world. Uh, some of those venues include Staples Center, the Q Arena in Cleveland where King James plays basketball, uh, the Clippers, the Galaxy, uh, overseas in London at the O2 Arena is another uh, client of ours. Uh, my particular role is that of a business leader and a business manager for any third party entity that wishes to connect into our ticketing system. Um, specifically, the Groupons of the world, the Living Socials of the world, and other uh, third party companies that surround the ticketing space, whether it's text to buy or seat upgrades in venues and all of these other kinds of fringe companies where a client will develop a relationship with one of these companies, I navigate and help that organization gain access to that client data so that both our clients can be successful and the third party relationship uh, partner can be successful. Uh, additionally, in my background, I am a uh, former adjunct professor here at Johnson & Wales University. Uh, I had done that for four or five years in the past, and it's always a pleasure to come back to campus and, and to uh, take on meetings like this. Um, additionally, in my background, a, a former executive of Ticketmaster, I was the New England Regional General Manager for a number of years, and then uh, in my last 10 years with Ticketmaster was based in New York City, and I operated the P&L for the entire Northeast region. Again, a pleasure to be here today. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> and finally, Ms. Jema Schiffer. I work for a company called Ticket Galaxy. If you guys have ever purchased tickets on StubHub, SeatGeek, GameTime, any of those types of third party, I would assume smart device applications. Most of you look like you aren't on a desktop very frequently, but if you're on an app buying tickets like that, more than likely, I would say seven out of 10 times, it's probably our inventory. I'm in the inventory acquisition business. So essentially, all day long, I shake hands, kiss babies, and make people feel good about working with what the primary would potentially call the boogeyman or the big bad wolf. Um, it's not the guy you see standing on the corner. I have not been asked to do that yet. If they did, I would not be working there anymore. But the secondary market is more so working with teams, venues, entertainment groups, and really complement a lot of what these guys are talking about in their business of meeting the fans where they're at in the buying process. So the Groupon was mentioned. And I would say around 2005, Groupon gave all of us a voice that if we bought as a group, we got a better price. So in that happening, the secondary, when we're meeting the fans where they're actually buying, which is on your smart device and probably within 24 hours of an event, if that event's not on there, or if there are no tickets, people just assume, oh, I can't go. So what we're doing is working with all these teams, venues, and entertainment groups, and working with the primary ticketing platforms to make sure we can acquire inventory and be able to get it to the end user, the fans who are going into each of these venues and events, which is interesting to be on a panel with these guys because all of our stuff is integrated whether we like it or not in some capacities, but I would say, based on the conversation we had at lunch, we all play very nicely in this space. And again, StubHub, Vivid, SeatGeek, all of those different sites, we play nice with them as well. So again, thank you for having us today. The, the lunch was amazing. You guys have a really cool culinary program. So <laughs> kudos to that. Thanks, Jamie.
So we're going to talk a little bit about their education before we get into more of the meat and potatoes of the industry that they work in. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with Jama. Um, how did, did, did your education prepare you for your career today? And if you could go back to college, what courses would you take, do you think? How it prepared me, I would say you guys all have a choice. We all have a choice. Every day we wake up, you choose whether you're going to show up to class on time. You choose whether you're going to get ready to go to class and participate or if you're going to be the person not sitting in the front row. The biggest takeaway for me, especially being a female, and I was one of three in all of my classes, and I'll tell you this too, of my graduating class, there's five of us in the industry of which are the three females and two males. The rest decided to go a different route. That being said, I was knocking on my professor's door saying, I need you to know who I am and this is what I want to do in this industry and I need you to help me get there. I knew all their backgrounds, I knew where they came from in the industry and who they could help introduce me to. So from an education standpoint, the day I walked onto campus at Robert Morris, which is in Pittsburgh, it was, okay, let's get a game plan. How are we going to do this? I only have four years. I actually graduated in three and said, hey, how are we going to get there? So I would challenge all of you guys to really take a look in the mirror at the, this last month of the semester. For those of you graduating, you don't have much time. But if you've got another semester or hopefully a couple years if you're a freshman, really make a decision what you want to do in this industry. And it may not be what you ultimately end up doing, as you'll hear from all of us. We've probably didn't take exactly the path we wanted to do to get where we're at, but go to your professors and ask them, how do I do it? So I always describe it like dating. You know, you go on these dates and you meet people and it's not Mr. or Mrs. Right, but it's something to understand where you want to go in the future for who you want to settle down with. So that would be from an education standpoint, have a plan. And then if I could go back to school and really concentrate harder, it would be, I loved my marketing courses but looking at the numbers more. Data analytics is probably something you guys are all being talked about, try to get yourself more involved in it. You don't have to be the coder or the person who's slicing and dicing the numbers, but understand what they're saying. Our industry could really use some people who understand the numbers so that when we all come in, we're having an intelligent conversation and we're not bringing you up to speed on what other teams or parts of a league are doing. So numbers, and I don't know if, is that economics, or what classes do you go for that? <laughs> Hence, wasn't paying attention for that stuff. I like the marketing stuff better, marketing and sales. Thanks, Jamie. Michael, uh, how did your education prepare you? And if you could go back to college, what would you take? So um, I was the, uh, first of all, show of hands, seniors graduating this year. How many? Oh. So the majority of the room. Congratulations. Great. You've may, almost made it. <laughs> Hopefully, there's no surprises over the last six weeks. <laughs> and that Professor Eskelson will be kind to you in your final grade. Um, so um, I was the middle child of six with parents that uh, grew up as uh, probation par parents, uh, you know, poor, undereducated. My father left high school to join the Navy because that's what men did back in the day. So there was not a lot of uh, love in my household for college. So when I announced I was going, going to go to college, my parents were both like, well, good luck, you know, have, have fun with that. <laughs> but you're gonna pay for it all yourself. And again, for the graduating seniors that paid your own way, paved this degree that you were about to get, and, and you paid for it yourself, congratulations, in 20 years, you'll thank yourself. Um, so I started down the path of community college in Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, while I also went to full-time work. There I received um, an education uh, associate's degree in literature, of all things. Uh, then I went, moved on to a local school system here in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, and uh, got a BA from the State University System in Massachusetts. My BA was in theater, theater design. I was going to be a light and scenery designer uh, as my craft. And again, my parents you know, rose to the occasion at the kitchen table and said, gee, that sounds great. Uh, how are you going to make any money? Um, and along that time, as I was studying theater, I also met my then future wife. And she wanted not a life of poverty and theater. <laughs> she wanted the white picket fence and the colonial house and the two kids and the dog. And 
you know, the life of a, of a theater designer does not afford you know, that opportunity. Uh, I was looking at being poor for the next 10 years. But I love the theater. When I proposed to my wife, I did it in a theater. And as corny as it sounds today, I said to her, if you can accept that the theater is my first mistress, uh, please marry me. And she was fool enough, she was foolish enough to do so. <laughs> and um, I thought about theater and what else could I do? And I thought moving into front of house was the right thing to do. And that's how I found box office work and marketing and the front of house things that uh, are inherent within our business and our industry. So I married, if you will, the two worlds together and have had just a great career and uh, more importantly, a, a fabulous relationship with my wife and two children over 30 years. Um, I also got my uh, master's degree MBA from um, um, Denver Reg Regis University. So how did this all prepare me for a world of ticketing and a professional life? Not so much, Lee, to be candid with you, but the liberal arts courses in math in sciences and um, word documents and typing on, on, on a program rather than a typewriter and learning those basic skills that were just coming out at that time is something that I would reinforce to everybody in this room. Learn about technology that you work and use every single day. Don't just use it, but understand the background. How does it come together? Understand some of the technology certainly know that every technology hopefully improves the bottom line of that particular business and businesses that it is associated with. So um, I'll leave you with the fact that there's been a tremendous amount of change in our industry over the last 25 years, but even more change will come in the next 25 to 50 years. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> Charlie? Hi. Same question. It was, uh, could you repeat the question, sure, please? Sure. Alex. So, <laughs> how, did, how did your education uh, here at Johnson Wales prepare you uh, sure. for your career? And if you could come back here, what courses would you take that you didn't take when you were here? It, it was interesting. When I came to Johnson Wales, I, I came as a freshman knowing where I wanted to work post graduation. I wanted to work for ESPN. I love the This Is Sports Center commercials. You guys seen them? I thought they were the best things on TV. And not because I was a giant sports fan, it was because I loved good marketing. I thought, you know, commercials were on all the time, but how many of them were really good, right? So that's where I wanted to work, knowing that going into school. And I said it freshman year to my mother, I said, when I graduate, this is where I'd like to work. Came here, majored in marketing, did an internship, uh, my junior year at a post-production house down in New York City. Lucky enough, I met a producer for ESPN, and I globbed on to this guy throughout my internship and made friends with him and stayed connected with him. Lucky enough where he had made some introductions for me. I said, hey, I'm graduating in May. I'd like to you know, potentially try to get a job at ESPN. Who could I speak with? He gave me three names or eight names or whatever it was. I did telephone interviews. Here, you know, over on the east side when I lived over there, and I can remember standing there with a house full of crazy people, and I'm trying to have a serious telephone <laughs> interview with a potential employer. Came home during the uh, second trimester break, Christmas break, or whatever it was, interviewed. Was lucky enough to have three job offers from ESPN in different departments upon graduating. Uh, chose a job that I just took that whatever offered the most money. It was in nothing to do with marketing. It was in program. It was in uh, operations and worked around the clock and worked weekends. But you know, I think one of the things coming here at Johnson and Wales that allowed me to get into that position is that I took a course that was professional development. I don't know that they still offer it. Do you guys? It was like a, a you had to take it uh, your senior year, and all you did was write cover letters, interview, be interviewed, and practice interviewing for you know a trimester. And I think it was one of the things that allowed me to kind of step ahead or get ahead, be prepared to kind of sit down and take, the, you know, take these interviews and then follow up with these people like crazy. And was able to kind of, you know, one, lucky enough to take an entry level job there, but then had to make a couple of 
uh, vertical, you know, uh, transitions to different jobs to be able to get to where I wanted to go. I did a couple of years in the operations department, then I went into the programming department, which was scheduling shows, and then finally got my break into the marketing department and spent six years there. Um, if I was to come back here and you know, other classes that kind of prepared me, I think, you know, the internship again, giving real world experience, networking, you know, might ne necessarily be a class. It's one thing I regretted that I didn't start younger. It was uh, a LinkedIn account. Does it, how, many, how many of you guys have a LinkedIn account? You, you know, that didn't exist back then. Building that network, making those connections, person, you know, and that, you know, building, it's going to be the most valuable thing that you can ever kind of create in your life because you'll never know who your next boss may be, business partner, customer, customer may be. So, you know, learning that type of stuff, being able to, you know, work on interviewing cover letters and resumes. Uh, but some of the things that, you know, I, I think was more on the event side of things that I, I'm much more involved with now, but I didn't, they didn't necessarily have the same program, sure. you know, when I was here. But years ago, I don't know if anyone's from here, the ESPN, the, like the first X Games, we're here in Providence, Rhode Island, and I remember volunteering to kind of help out and be like, I, I just want to be involved. You know, when they were having the street luge down College Hill and they had all sorts of great events going on here, but that kind of fired my inspiration to kind of do it. But I think it was the professional development classes, which I still, you know, owe a lot to, uh, networking, and then kind of just keeping at it. Thanks, John. Dan? I think I'll just go down the panel. I'll echo Jamin's recommendation. If you haven't taken a stats class and you're coming out of undergrad, buckle up, right? Um, you, you need those skills because um, you're going to have be going up against some people that have some serious chops coming out with a degree or something around microeconomics and you're going to be in the room with them and they're going to blow past you. <laughs> blow past you. So whether you didn't take it here Go find a community college, take a stats class. This is like consequence free for you guys. Audit the class, get a C in it. It doesn't matter, but just to have that appreciation of what you're gonna have, because any role that you have as you move up into, uh, into a management role, you're gonna have to have that capacity to make decisions based on data, and you're really gonna wanna have that vocation. So whether it's community college here at Johnson & Wales, Khan Academy, something free, get a stats book, read it and know it. Um, that's something that I was a little bit late in in my uh, undergrad career, a little bit of a gotcha. Um, on Michael's note, um, if your parents or somebody in your family has helped you out with your uh, tuition along the way, uh, see if you can get your last tuition bill and chip in on it. It's like one of the best advice I got from somebody um, coming in and just say, hey, I wanna pay 500 bucks for this last check. Um, chances are someone in your family will just give it right back to you. But the thought that counts. So if you're somebody like Michael that grounded out, I mean, you're going to meet people like that. And he is an absolute titan in our industry. And it's because he had that character building experience of paying his own way. It was a foundational part of it. And it's not the first time I've heard that story. And it's awesome. So I would do it. Um, and then for Charlie, that verb kind of globbing on yeah. to somebody <laughs> uh, that's very much how I've stayed uh, in the entertainment industry. And those of you who are here earlier, you met my mentor, Maureen Anderson. Um, so I was on a much different path in my career, just waiting for my wife to kind of finish up her graduate degree and then taking a shot in, in public service, going to work for the US State Department. And Maureen just kind of got me, Talked to me and said, no way, you know, you're part of the tribe already. You, know, you just got to stick with this. You're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And I really just followed her around the country for about three years, um, literally just doing everything she did and learning her ways and learning my way around. Um, and I couldn't be more thankful. Um, so if you, you're going to find, you know, depending on what episode you are in your career, it might be here at undergraduate. It might be in that first job, your internship. You never really know where that first person that you're gonna really wanna glob onto is gonna be. Uh, but listen to that, you know, because that's not gonna be something that's always gonna make sense. It's probably gonna pull you off of that path that you were on, um, but it can really have great impact. So whether it's a coach, a mentor, um, someone of your first bosses, hopefully you luck out early, maybe it comes a little bit later, but to listen to that. 
Thanks, so Dan. I, I have a question for Charlie. Sure. So ESPN was your goal. Sure. Even it's before wild. you started day one. Sure. That's wild. That's lofty goal. Yeah. Because it was, <laughs> you know, had just started. Place. But then Quinnipiac University, also in Connecticut, sure. is tightly knit with ESPN, mm -hmm. and that's where they... You want to know how he ended up here? How do you come <laughs> to Johnson <and> Wales <laughs> when well, Quinnipiac... He was right in the backyard. <laughs> It was easier to spell John. Well, no, no one can spell honest, God, <laughs> God's honest truth. My best friend was coming here for culinary arts, and he said, hey, I got an application, and they give you one for a friend. He's like, here. <laughs> That's awesome. Marketing 101. Is, is he a friend to this He's day? To, yeah, to okay. this day. And I applied, and I did not even visit, and I got accepted, and then I was like, take it. School of Marketing, it's near the beach, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was wrong, you know. So and yeah, the ocean state, right? Okay. So, yeah. but that long story short, that's how it kind of it just happened. But things like that happen too when you network and meet people and talk to them. You know, when we talk about globbing on and finding people, you'll find that a lot of senior level people will look for young people and want to help out and try to get them, right? You know, moved up in the world and take under their wing. A lot of the smartest people I ever know, they'd like, they'll see something in you. They'll like something about you and they'll want to support. But you have to look for it, you know? And you have to be, be you know, you got to stand out among everybody else. Just kind of keeping your head down and doing your thing is not going to necessarily get you to a different level. I have the funniest story where I was at ESPN and I was very good at the copier machine for some reason. Anything <laughs> got stuck in the copier, like, oh, ask Charlie. He could get the unstuck piece of paper. And there was a young kid walking around there and he's like ah i was like oh you having trouble he's like yeah could you help me so i go in there get his paper unstuck from the copier turns out 15 years later he's now the president of cbs sports and now that i'm here and i sent him an email message on linkedin and i said hey david it's charlie you remember me could you help i would love to talk to somebody at cbs so and so and so and so 15 minutes no problem charlie got you covered it was all because I helped them unstick a paper you know, in, a, in a copy machine. For someone who I didn't know where it would end up 15 years later, President of CBS Sports, and he'll still, and I'll reach out and he'll send me an email back and make the connections. And that's all you can ask. But that was just from helping somebody with a copy machine. That's great. So you've gotten some great words of wisdom from this panel about uh, career preparation and career aspirations. So I hope you've taken some, some notes. We're gonna switch over now to the industry itself and we'll go back to Jema. Um, from your perspective, what do you think is the most important and or significant challenge facing you and your company in the sports and entertainment business today? I would say right now, like how we started this out, is most people think the secondary market is the guy who's standing on the corner with the sign that says, I need two tickets, and really he's going to try to sell you two tickets. Like I said, I don't have any tickets in here to sell you guys. I'm in the process of trying to acquire tickets, which was part of our morning commute up here before coming to this ticket talk was to meet with Providence College. So it's the, the bigger thing that I'm seeing is coming from the primary and my background's actually with uh, New Orleans Hornets who don't exist anymore and it was the New Orleans Hornets that had just left from Charlotte and all of you look way too young to even know that the Charlotte Hornets packed up overnight, went to New Orleans. And then this little thing called Katrina came. Yeah. We ended up in Oklahoma City for two seasons, sold out in 37 days, so we kind of sold each other out of a job, stayed with the team, and then got a call from a guy by the name of Jerry Jones to go sell the new Cowboy Stadium. So coming from that side of the world and doing group ticket sales, season ticket sales, extremely ridiculous 30-year seat license sales for suites and seats, to then come over here and understand, I must have been chugging the Jerry Jones Kool-Aid because I don't know what I'm doing next week, let alone we were just all talking about, oh, you're going to LA in two weeks. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be there too. I haven't even booked a flight yet. Oh, I better do that. I sold people on a 30 year basically mortgages for AC and most of them were buying three to four at Cowboy Stadium. I don't even know if I'm gonna be a fan of a team in five sure. seasons or if that team's even going to be around and move to a new city. So to move to the secondary, my thought process was more of we need as fans more control over what we're buying because on the primary side, we're telling everybody what to do. But if we're on the secondary side and we can find ways from the primary ticketing solution and the secondary people who, like our company, has some very deep pockets, we can come in and supplement any budgetary needs up front. 
And as you guys learn, I don't know if you've got chances to meet with any of, pro, of the pro teams and understand ticket sales and how that works, but that's in some cases how the lights are being kept on. Ticket sales, sponsorship sales, suite sales. So if you have somebody like our company coming in to buy that inventory, that's one less budgetary line item you have to worry about. Now it's how do we get those fans to come in here and create a great experience. So the big challenge for us is more of the perception of this is a partnership. We want to work with the ticketing platforms. We want to work with the teams, venues, and entertainment groups. We want to be consultive. But at the end of the day, it is a business, and each party needs to make money. But how do we come together in a cohesive unit to do that? Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Michael, most important or significant challenge facing you and your company? Boy, um, technology and the integrations that it presents. Uh, again, in my role as uh, director of national accounts, I'm working with, at any given time, 30 or 40 different companies that wish to engage with our client base in either selling tickets, performing data analytics, um, whatever that particular client need is. And for a ticketing engine, a, a software that needs to be malleable to all of those organizations, and to, to deliver that integration as seamlessly as possible takes a great amount of commitment from the service provider, which is access.com, and it takes a commitment from each of those third parties. All of the software is different. All of the hardware has nuance to it. And integrating with so many diverse partners is a big challenge. And yet, it needs to be done because you as consumers are consuming information, content, and purchasing tickets in a myriad of different ways that it did not exist 20 years ago. So as an organization, you have to be cognizant of the ways that fans are engaging and electing to purchase their tickets, and, and you have to keep up with that pace to the, base of, to the best of your ability as a company. Thanks, Michael. Charlie? I'll echo this though. It's, it, it's also technology based. It's one of the big, it's always evolving, it's always changing. One of the things that we do really well is that being able to track who actually comes to these events. Um, so, from even a security standpoint, where no longer are these venues, okay, how many tickets did we sell? How many people actually showed up? But then they would like to know who actually came there. You know, and uh, for myriads of reasons, mostly for us, it's through marketing. You know, they want to know who was invited, who showed up, what did they do when they got there. So tracking all that data. Um, there's also, you know, collecting this data is not always in the limelight of everything with Facebook you see in the news now. What are you doing with my data? Are you selling my data? But protecting that data, collecting credit card information, making sure that, so from a technology, staying on top of technology, we are very cognizant of that, because um, if we don't stay on top of technology, we could soon become a dinosaur and become extinct. So we're always kind of trying to learn new things, how we could do it better, how we could play nice, plug and play with other systems, and be able to kind of communicate the, that data of information and display it for somebody. But technology is definitely one Great. of the bigger things. Thanks, Charlie. Dan? Yeah, for us, really managing some legislative risk. Um, we are a, a free market economy in the U.S., but we have a lots of what I would call rules changes to contend with. And if you're a software company, you really want to build what your user community wants. You want to build what's going to help you make more money. Um, but really, we spend an inordinate amount of time just staying compliant, whether that's with the payment card industry, which is really not fun stuff to build, right? It's anti-fraud, fraud prevention, data protection, like what we've talked about. Um, sometimes we're contending with tax law changes. Again, not fun. Um, it really changes the business model for several of our, most of our clients, just in terms of what their revenue sources are. So making sure that, again, we're being able to tune our technology to manage some of the legislative and law changes, tax law changes that come through. <laughs> So it's really not fun stuff, but it really has something that we have to pay an inordinate amount of attention to, to stay a few chapters ahead so we can take care of our customers. Great answer, thank you. Uh, uh, Charlie, we'll go to you. Where, where do you see uh, the growth in your business 
and if you could look in your crystal ball, sure. where do you want your company to be in 10 years? Sure, and I think it's, it's the personal experience, but also providing, you know, it's <clears> gonna <throat> be, for us, it's the big data play, right? So getting as much big data on attendees that we could possibly get and store and be able to learn uh, from that, you know? So uh, we were talking at lunch about an example of if uh, somebody owns a luxury suite at the Boston Red Sox, great, I know who that customer is, but who are the 16 people that they're bringing? Because I want to kind of reach out to them. So it's really, I think, uh, putting it all in the hand of the consumer, being able to do everything by their phone. Uh, we take a mobile first kind of, uh, you know, practice, and, uh, but being able to take that data, capture that data, and being able to provide them sort of a, a seamless experience. And where we see the company being is, again, it's, it's staying up with the technology where things are going. Because now with you guys, I don't know if you're familiar with Beacon technology, where you could track people, and not only when you get in through the door, but where you're going. If you go to one of the most connected stadiums out in San Francisco, you could do anything from your seat now. You know, instead of going and waiting online to order your hot dogs, it's, and you open up your app, you kind of da download that type of stuff. Um, and just the way technology is kind of, with, at least on the sports side of things, with, that you could do is you know, really where we look to be players. And Thanks, just John. something that came out of lunch today was a, a conversation topic of really giving you guys an understanding of what jobs are actually out there. And when Dan had reiterated the whole looking at stats, making sure you can understand the numbers. What Charlie's talking about when you're ordering those hot dogs on the app, is now it's trackable how many hot dogs. Yes, they know how many people came to the concession stand to get those, but again, going back to your culinary program and the food management process of this, is somebody can actually look at how many hot dogs do we need. I can tell you guys, and we all have more stories of this over the years of the venues we've worked in and the entertainment groups we've worked with, but when we opened Cowboy Stadium in 2009, first off, I went in with a hard hat. Where the stadium wasn't done. We totally smoke and mirrored, put up all this stuff. But do you want to know that Miller Lite sold more beer in that one event than they had sold at Tech Stadium the year before? So in one event, George Strait opened that stadium. They sold out. They did not anticipate that at all. We ran out of hamburgers. We ran out of straws. I don't even know what else happened that day because it was pretty much a blur. But having an app and collecting this data and being prepared, Levi Stadium didn't have the same hiccups. Did they have hiccups? Yes. But the same group of people who were selling Cowboy Stadium became part of the management group who became part of the decision makers for Levi's. And now you've got all these other stadiums opening up. So when we talk about the data, it's not just you know crunching numbers on your, I'm just gonna say your smart device because I don't think anybody even uses a real calculator anymore. But hear what we're saying, but really let it soak in of, no, you probably don't want to count hot dogs, but what does that mean for a company in the industry? How, what is the ROI, what return on investment, if you're not familiar with that term? How do these numbers affect people? And then come back to what we're saying, and oh, that, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I should look into an opportunity in event management, or not always ticket sales or sponsorship sales, but there's so many other opportunities in this industry. Great point, Shaman. Michael, where, do you, where, would, where would you like your company to be in 10 years, and where do you think it will be in 10 years? In 10 years, we want to rule the world. Um, <laughs> right. Dan works for a competitor. We hope he's out of a job in 15 years. <laughs> Two or three. <laughs> There's a big, bad company out there that dominates the marketplace, and I'd like to see them go out of business uh, based on our hard work and success. Um, so yes, we want to rule the world. Uh, and I think you get there by offering the best technology and the best data, which I don't, I don't refer to data as such, I refer to data as fan behavior. If you understand as a team or as an entity, if you understand how fans engage with that team and how fans come into that arena, um, then you are one step, one huge step above everybody else. Um, Fan behavior is critical, I think, to a professional sports team success and a venue success. Uh, the goal is to drive that consumer back to that arena or that team 
versus all of the other choices that you have today for your uh, discre discretionary income spend. You could go to the movie, you can go to a nightclub. You, there's hundreds of things to do today that are very small money to engage with. Whereas uh, pro teams, it's getting fairly costly to be able to go to an event. It's getting fairly costly to be, go to a concert at the Dunkin' Donuts Center uh, for a variety of reasons. But if you understand your data and how fans engage with you, uh, you can get that fan to repeat their business more often than not. Great, thanks Michael. Jamie, we will come back to you. So what, where would you like to see your company be and where do you think it will be in 10 years from now? I think more so it's the open lines of communication. And again, reiterating whether it's from the primary ticketing platform, the primary ticket sales in general, but I would say give it 24 months. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Amazon tickets and what they're trying to do. I may not have a job at this particular company because it doesn't exist anymore. This model doesn't exist anymore. Dan mentioned it being a free market and the seat geeks of the world with the open distribution. Essentially, we're a company right now who funds buying inventory. So when we do that, yeah, it helps the team's bottom line. Then we take it and then we go out and sell it. But imagine the day where you go to Amazon, again, on your smart device, not on your desktop, laptop, wherever it might be, or maybe you just say, Alexa, no. get me my toothpaste, get me my Patriots jersey. Are there two tickets available for this Sunday's game? And all of a sudden a drone comes tapping on your patio yeah. door and Drop drops them all off. But just kidding, there's not tickets because those just got emailed to your smart device. <laughs> or I'm sorry, your smart watch mm -hmm. that you're then gonna walk into the venue with. So in 10 years, no, what I'm doing right now may not exist, but you know what? What I was doing 10 years ago, selling group tickets, that really doesn't exist anymore either. How many of you guys have done any sales internships where you're smiling and dialing? Awesome. Yeah, it was, yeah, good for all you right, for yeah. that, that. I love the fact you got on the phone, but we're also in a world now of social selling, and my definition of that, and compared to what teams may be calling it, it doesn't mean you still don't hop on the phone. We don't give credit cards over email or anything like that. You still have to talk to somebody, but we're going a different route. Dan and I virtually met on LinkedIn two weeks ago when Lee said we were gonna be on this panel. Michael and I should have already met based on the people that we know within the industry, and he talks to my boss all the time. So 10 years ago what I was doing, I'm now the virtual group salesperson of the industry, working around the clock, and I'm paying teams to do this. They're not paying us. So it's, it's a wild, wild west on the secondary right now, and I'll tell you, I'm here just for the ride at the moment, and I think we can all attest that the, the wolf packing that happens. You, you look for that opportunity or you look for the good people in the industry to, I don't wanna say ride their coattails, but you wanna wolf pack with them to whatever that next big thing's going to be. We, I think we joked at lunch too of how the bottleneck, when you guys get into those upper management positions, there's only so many teams, leagues, whatever it might be, there's only so many new projects to build a new stadium. So how are you gonna diversify your talents and whatever those new things are coming. I mean, collegiate space right now. The joke is 1999 just called and they still have a Zach Morris flip phone if you go into a collegiate ticket office. And then you come into these pro and stadiums and venues and there's artificial intelligence greeting you, sure. saying, hello, Jayma, thank you for coming today. Sure. You're going this way to meet with so-and-so. Sure. But you go into a collegiate one and it's like, we had it, Haley and I had it happen today. The security guard sent us the wrong direction. We went completely on the other side of campus and it was just like, okay. So there's so much opportunity out there. And again, to answer your question, what I do right now may not exist. And, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. You definitely have to be ready to pivot and evolve in this business it's, and change is your friend. It's, it's very much like the music industry. So oh, like yeah. before that, like you used to be able to you know, go buy DVDs in the music industry. <laughs> do they even know what, yeah. like a cassette? Do you guys know what you know, But everything, are? they that they fought, the, they yeah. tried to legislate yeah. DVD, you know, streaming. The Napster. And, you know, and, and say, you know what, we're never gonna let you stream music online and download it change that but the companies that were successful kind of embraced that and said yeah, okay if this it. is the way the market's going we need to kind of adjust with that and that's always going to change no matter what yeah. the industry is especially with ticketing events and things that have got where they're going it's a changing game constantly 
So that's why, like. I mean, and would you guys say, too, that's part of the reason we're probably all still drawn back to this industry is you don't know what's going to happen yeah. each day. It yeah. changes it's there all around us, and it's just a matter of if we want to embrace it or if we want to fight it. And if you're going to fight it, probably going to have to go get a new job, maybe even in a new industry. Dan, uh, look I at think your crystal the, ball. <laughs> go ahead. Look in your crystal ball. My ten, crystal ball? Ten yeah. years. <laughs> I, I think in, in 10 years out, I, I think that the nature of the inventory that most of us are selling will change. Some of that's going to be on the content side. Uh, it's not going to be as much stick and ball sports. Um, so if any of you have been to an eSports event, if you've been to Comic-Con, if you've been to an anime show, um, probably the best example would be PAX East up at the BCEC in Boston. Uh, I think they're doing about 160,000 over two days up there. So the people at Fenway, um, the people at Boston Garden are looking at that saying, wow, how'd we miss that, mm -hmm. right? So I think just the nature of entertainment and maybe not exactly what your generation, but the people that are five and 10 years younger than you, what they're entertained by is changing very quickly. Mm -hmm. We've been a little bit slow to adapt as technology providers. So we're, we're really looking at what's that experience for that type of content and what's the transaction look like? Is it a membership model, like a subscriber or a season ticket holder? Is it a single ticket transaction? Are you wanting to buy access? Is it timed entry, almost like what museums used to do? Um, what's happening there? So we're really studying what the new type of content that's coming out and how we can wrap our technology around that. The other different inventory type of play is actually within the stick and ball sports, but the venues are actually changing. So if you look at the renovations at the ACC in Toronto, one of North America's biggest buildings, they're removing seats. They're taking stuff out of their premium areas. They're taking stuff out of their clubs, fixed seats, because people just want to hang out. They don't want to watch the Leafs anymore, or they want to say they went to the Leafs game, but really they want better bar access, and they don't want to be three deep between periods, trying to elbow their way for a good spot. They want that club experience. So there again, how do we sell that as a technology provider? How do we help track the movement through a building? Um, and really, how do we help surface some relevant data to the owners on what's going on in their building from a transaction standpoint? So we're really paying attention to the content side of what's going on, what people will be entertained by, and then really from the, the architecture standpoint of what's happening with the actual inventory that we process now. Great answers from all of you. Charlie, you were going to say something? Yeah, one of the things I think that we're kind of, we're involved with we, virtual reality. Have you guys ever experienced proper virtual reality with a headset on? So they're streaming a lot of live sports and virtual reality. The NBA as a league really embraces technology and eventually there's gonna be virtual courtside seats and where you'll be able to walk, put a headset on and you're sitting there under the basket. How many front row seats can you sell virtually as opposed to how many you physically have here. And so as that technology kind of grows, it's going to change the sports and entertainment industry as well. Um, as the headsets get better, as the technology and the streaming gets better, but people being able to watch games at home. But I think it will always have a social aspect of it. I think people coming and actually enjoying the game, there could be an oversaturation of technology. I don't know if you've seen, even now with augmented reality, if you go to a baseball game and there's some augmented reality apps, you could hold your phone up and it will show you different kind of more data, more information about the game as opposed to just kind of sitting there and watching it. You know, you'll be able to hold your phone up and know how many hits were to left field, how many were to right, where does, you know, this guy, his best, you know, where's his weak spot in his pitching zone? But that, like, all that technology kind of changes and impacts the bit. it will impact the business. Yeah. Great. Uh, we're running out of time, unfortunately. I mean, we're, I've got a half of, a bunch of questions <laughs> still to ask, but they've been <laughs> giving us some great information already. So let's go to one more question ac across the panel, and then I'll, I'll open it up for questions from the floor. Um, so, and Jamie did a great job of pointing out the future is, in, in many respects, in terms of employment, is unknown in terms of what your job title is going to be. Uh, but I think they do know uh, what's going to be expected of you in terms of a skill set and what are the things you need to be able to do when you're leaving here and you've got your graduation cap on and you walk across the state. So talk a little bit about, and Jamie, we'll start with you. Um, what do you think that, just throw out some, some, what do you think some of the job types names are going to be? 
uh, and what do you think the skill sets are in, in terms of your company uh, that they could eventually be applying for? I would say if I got to choose more so a social selling strategy and activation person would become what a salesperson used to be. That you're, instead of smiling and dialing, you're on LinkedIn looking for key target people who will resonate with your product, service, offering, whatever it may be, and you are going through a traditional sales process, but you're having this conversation in the cloud because all of us are so much more comfortable behind this smart device saying whatever we say, hopefully it's for the positive, and then in person being able to meet and it's all the casualties are gone and you're able to close that deal and understand what those objectives truly were. So you cut out a lot of that by having that virtual connection to then bring in-person conversation. So the ticket salesperson's not going to exist. And I also, I mean, candidly, I never thought I would be saying this, but the Smile and Island days, they're, they're over. You have to get way more strategic. How many of us look at our phone, and even if it says mom or grandma, like, I'm not answering that. You can text me. What do you want? You know, we're, not, we're screening our phone calls. And, and I'll tell you, I'm the first person, if you look at my resume, I was the person on the team who was making the 100 plus calls. So on average, we were hitting what our sales managers wanted. So I've come a whole, what is that, 180, 360, whatever way you want to look at that, of I don't need to smile and dial to have answering machines or whatever it may be. I want to make 30, 20 very strategic phone calls to collect a credit card, close a deal, meet somebody in person. Be, I mean, I'm even thinking about how this happened. We got an email from Intix that was saying Maureen was being featured as a visiting professor. Well, Intix is something that I, it's 2018, really wanted to get involved with. I'm part of our Tri-City group that's Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. And lo and behold, my email that I responded back, hey, I'd love to be there to support Maureen. And it found its way to Lee's email box, and lo and behold, he had an empty seat on the panel. If we don't know where the next opportunity may be coming from, and I look at myself as sitting in a social selling opportunity. We, we just don't know, and it goes back to my original comment of when you wake up each day, we all have choices. And what's your choice going to be tomorrow after you take away from everything that we've said, what decisions are you gonna be making towards the next 30 days for your job? Or for those of you who still have a couple years, how are you gonna get strategic, reach out to each of us and connect with us and get a better understanding of where you wanna be going in this industry? Or are you just gonna get that piece of paper, put it on your wall, be happy that you finished it, and just take another job that pays the bills? Great answer. Michael, what do the future jobs look like at your company? Always fan advocates. You know, people to interact with the fans, coming into an event, um, going to an event. Always, uh, the, the titles might change, but always marketing people. Always getting a message out about events that are incoming, how well the team is performing or what the highlights are of that particular team. Whatever messaging needs to get out there to incentivize a fan to go to the live event. Uh, there will always be finance people, always accounting. You always, always have to uh, follow the money and track the money. Uh, there will always be uh, security people, uh, um, inventory management control, uh, formerly known as box office uh, managers. Uh, so uh, I think that a, lar a lot of the core positions will have naming convention changes, mm -hmm. but will still exist over the next five to ten years. Thanks, Michael. Charlie? I'll echo it. It's really uh, any type of experiential kind of uh, industry portion of it where you're out there being the face. You know, when you're meeting the people that are attending the games, your customers are sitting in the suites, you know, kind of. Uh, I personally think you'll see a very, you know, a lot of people sitting home on their devices. I think the next big boom is people coming together and having these experiences. You talked about taking seats out, making it more of a kind of a, you know, social experience. Uh, I think people that are on that front, being able to talk to people, uh, being able to network, uh, and kind of following. You'll, you know, you'll find a thing that you're passionate about, and if you follow the industry trades, you'll get an idea of where this is going. And a lot of it is driven by new technology, what is making people's lives easier and quicker and easier to do. 
uh, but I think anything from the experiential kind of side of things, the titles may change, but you know, it's, it's a marketing, and even if you may not be in sales, you're always in sales, always in no sales. matter what your title is, even if you're just selling yourself, but it's, it's marketing, it's sales, and you know, from the experience perspective. Thanks, Charlie. Last but not least, Dano. Certainly least. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, vocationally, I, I would be, say be able to speak in full sentences to another adult, looking at them in the eye um, and being able to express yourself well. And that's something that when we do, and all of us do quite a bit of interviewing, um, we're seeing a bit of a struggle there, right? Who are you? What do you do? Where are you from? These are simple questions. You ought to be able to nail them. Um, so if you don't feel very confident interviewing or expressing yourself, practice. Um, you know, find a professor, find someone like us. We'd be happy to do cold interviews for you. I'm volunteering everyone here. Yeah, sure. I'm down. Right. Uh, but this is the stuff that we do and we'd love to help. Um, otherwise, in terms of, of jobs out there, um, I would love to say that all of the, the roles will be in the fun stuff, uh, the marketing, selling, um, representing a brand or a team. I do think the money will be oriented more towards safety. And so I think that the roles that are gonna be coming up both in technology, even at the franchise level, they're gonna have a little bit more of a security orientation for the next four or five years. And that's simply because if the places that we go to play and be entertained, if they're not safe, no one's gonna go, mm -hmm. right? So we've been worried a little bit about broadcast quality increasing so much, people are staying home. Uh, now people are worried about, hey, can I send my kid to that concert? Can I send my kid to that show? Do I even wanna go to myself? So I think there's gonna be an inordinate amount of spend and investment at the franchise, at the municipal level, in entertainment districts, uh, and at the venue level, just spent on security. Get yourself familiar with those companies. They're not represented up here, uh, but do a little bit of digging because you're gonna see a ton of investment in that space. Absolutely. Please give the panel a big uh, welcome. Thank you for... Fortunately, like I said at the beginning, we're taping this because you'll see this in, 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 in your professor's classes again and again because they've said some tremendous stuff up here today already and I didn't even get to half the questions I wanted to. But I do want to open it up to you because this is for you. We bring these, uh, these tremendous professionals to campus for you. So this is your chance in the next 15 minutes to ask them questions. So start over here. like you had touched on it, but like, where do you see it going to like really maintain a safe environment? Uh, a few things from a, a ticketing technology standpoint, I think the tolerance for anonymous fans in venues is going to end very quickly. If you were at Maureen's keynote this morning, she used the phrase, we're really one bad incident away from really having more of a bit of a check-in model, uh, more conditioned to what you have with a, an airline. Um, so I think that's one thing, just being able to furnish public safety officials a full manifest of who's in the building as a paid attendee. Um, one of the other things that we talked about at lunch is who's working for you? Who's in your building? What's the credential profile? It's an amazing, actually shocking, uh, of dark secret is you, know, you have these, particularly in the festival space, casual environment, uh, NASCAR, major events, people do not know who's representing them and working them. Um, it's a lot of volunteers that are oriented. So being able to have a much more acute look at who's back of house, um, who's working in your building. Um, so I think you know, people are really sharpening up on what can their ticketing company help them do to identify anonymous fans, graduate to a check-in model? All of us are there. Sure. Um, and then on the back of house side, uh, how do I really tighten up the credentialing environment and the access environment from both passes, um, shift work, check-in, check-out? Um, so there's, there's a lot happening there and we're all 
hustling on every side of the live entertainment business to get that done, but there's a ton of work to do. Anybody else want to chime in on that question? Uh, it hit the nail on the head with the security thing. I, every year the Super Bowl goes to a host city and what they'll do is ask for volunteers and they'll get maybe 20,000 volunteers to help and like, you know, they'll get a swag bag out of it. They'll be the ones out there giving directions, oh, you know, to all the people that are coming and visiting. Well, a few years ago, they used to just be volunteers. Now they've changed the whole process where they actually have to be employees. And every year they have to reapply. Now, a lot of it is based on the security. They don't want to have a bad fan experience. So we, they worked with the Disney Institute to create a whole program to train no longer volunteers or seasonal employees. And every year they have to reapply for a position, even if you do it from city to city. And so and they, that includes a background check, as opposed to like, hey, Super Bowl's coming to my town. Yeah, I'll sign me up. I want to volunteer. You show up at a meeting, and they'll be like, all right, you're in this group. You're doing this. Oh, no. Now it's an you know, online interview, you know, application, background check, and everything. And then a process of training of how you deal with fans, security, because they also use them as eyes on the streets for any kind of thing that might be at place. Great comment, Charlie. Anybody else? Next question from the house. Oh, come on. Haley, you said you were going to have one. Oh, here's one. Right, here's, there's three of them. Good. We go. We'll start here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys said that you do quite a bit of interviewing. Is What do you look for on a graduating student's resume? Let's, let's, hey, uh, let's, let's, anybody specific or the whole group? Cool. I would say my, my big thing right now, and I know it's probably not going to be the most likable probably answer, but how many of you have reached out to industry professionals and asked what's keeping you up at night? What Excel project are you working on that I could take three hours of my day and it's fresh in my mind because I just took a computer class and could do a data research through pivot tables and different things that you know how to do that, believe it or not, some of the people in the industry don't. Mm -hmm. Be again, believe this or not. But these are things that are sitting on our to-do piles. We just don't have time to get to them. So rather than pizza delivery, lifeguard, babysitter, whatever it might be, good for you. You're responsible, not to make that sound brash or anything like that. But do you know what it says to me if you reached out to any of us and said, what's keeping you up at night? What's a three-hour project I'm not asking to get paid that I could take on for you this week that's no harm, no foul of your company and any access to any privy information or anything like that. But to start looking on there and see those, the first place I go on your resume is who do you know that I know? And if Lee's name's on there, I'm like, oh, Lee. So before I even get to you, I'm calling him. Mm -hmm. But if I start seeing, oh, you did this project for so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and so -and -so. okay, this is interesting. You, you've reached out. You know how to reach out to people. They let you do a project. I can ask them specifically how that went. Then I'll go to your references. But a lot of times, that's unfortunately not what you guys are hearing right now. It's keep it to one page. Are the margins OK? Do you have references on there? Are your references somebody reliable and noteworthy in the industry? And I, I would love to see more things that jump out that show me that don't tell me that you want a job in this industry. Great answer. Michael? Yes, yeah, similarly, I want to see an investment in the industry. The candidates that rise to the top for me have some kind of experience. If they, whether it's an internship or, or volunteer yeah. or a three, three hour report, whatever it might be, you know, it's always, what can you do for me? Mm -hmm. How do you make me look better and I do my job easier, even though it is harder for you? That's what it's supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> If, if you don't have any of that internship experience or background, then I want to know for that interview, what was your prep? What have you learned about the company? What have you learned about me? Uh, because we're face to face and we're going to have a dialogue. If you have not done any investment in research about the company that you're talking to, you're going to have a very slim chance to go to the next level of interview. Sure. Great answer, Michael. Charlie? It, it, real world experience, if it's an internship, volunteering, getting involved, whatever the case may be. Um, but I also think I 
personally, we do a lot of social kind of background checks and I want to see what you look like online. I want to see where you, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, any of the other social platforms. You know, we're looking at it. You know, we're into technology, so it's a little, it applies a little bit more. Um, and then usually it's, you know, if somebody has their own domain name, you know, does anyone have their own name as their domain? Like, I'm Charlie Callahan. I have charliecallahan.com. Does anyone own their own name? We got one. Nice. You can own your own domain and you can put a free website up there. It costs you 20 bucks for a year and you can have your resume up there, what you're aspiring to do, things that, you know, that type of stuff, that is a step above everybody else. The one person that has it puts it on their resume. You want other copies? It's on charliecallahan.com. And to do something like that, for me, that's a kind of step above. And then also, just being that we do a lot of web-based technology stuff, I like to see if anybody's written about anything. I don't care what you're writing about, as long as it's something that you're passionate about. So if it's you're passionate about cats and you're writing a blog about cats or something like that, I, that's fine. It doesn't have to be relevant to what we do. I like to see people that are kind of active in that type of stuff. But that's kind of specific, specific to us because we do a lot of technology. Daniel? Uh, yeah, I'd say uh, I want to know that you're off the couch. Like, what's your level of activity? Are you involved? Because um, if it's just school, we're probably not interested. Um, to echo a couple others, uh, the derivation of how we are introduced is probably of most interest to me. Um, who did you know? How did you find me? Um, and that should be a pretty simple answer, uh, right? And then. Um, I think the writing sample is really interesting. How do you surface what you're proud of with your written expression? Uh, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. But just putting your hand up in a room like this, I know you're looking for a job. And I think just making yourself easy to be helped, making yourself saying, yeah, I am looking. Can you help? Do you care? Um, that's going to make it a lot easier for you than just kind of sitting in the background. Sure. Great comments. Somebody else had their hand up out here. I saw it. Come on. One or two. Haley. Haley. <laughs> Full disclosure, this is one of uh, uh, Jamma's uh, uh, cool. colleagues. <laughs> there was this a fifth chair up here yeah. for Haley. Oh, okay. it out. This is for the whole panel. Um, what would you say is the most common misconception of working in the world of tickets? Great question. Of course. Snowball there. Who wants to start? Go ahead, somebody. We do not hang out with the players and entertainers. <laughs> I can't get you free tickets. <laughs> I do not get you free tickets. I literally had to write on my Facebook wall, unless you birthed me or are part of my nuclear family, do not ask me for Super Bowl tickets. Yeah. I had to earn those. I was top 10, top 10 salesperson, so won a free ticket, and then we all got to purchase two. So my mom, dad, and myself got to sit in the infamous seats that didn't exist at Cowboy Stadium during the Ice Bowl. But stories beyond days for that game, but no free tickets. <laughs> Michael? Um, hmm. Take, I'll, i got to take a pass. Let somebody else go. It's I'll Charlie. come back to <laughs> Charlie. You know, one of the things is that, especially in sports, if you're working, if you want to work in sports and entertainment, you're going to be working a lot of times when a lot of people want to be off. You know, so, you know, you're sitting home on Thanksgiving. There is football games on Thanksgiving. So if you're working in sports, you're probably, you're working at that venue. You're working, you know, uh, in, if you're working in TV or broadcast, you're working those holidays and those times off and the things like that. So it's not all glorious. You gotta realize that there's a lot of sacrifice that you have to kind of make based with the uh, event, ticket, sports and entertainment kind of field that it's not a tradition, you know, for most part, they're not traditional hours. And so even if, you know, Easter Sunday, I mean, there's Major League Baseball's games on on Easter Sunday and everyone that's working at those venues, are, they're, they're there working, you know, so they don't get to enjoy those holidays off. But there's pros and cons with that, you know. You do get to see and to meet some amazing people and do some really cool things, but there's, you know, it's not all glory. Right. I would say for this audience, if you're looking for that first opportunity in the industry, what I would dispel is your best opportunity is probably not in a major market. It is probably not with an MLB, NBA, NHL, NFL, MLS franchise. Uh, go out there. Find an obscure role where you're going to learn a ton. 
in a secondary tertiary market where you're not scrapping and having a second job or a third job to make rent. Um, go out there to a smaller franchise, to a smaller venue, one of the secondaries and one of the tertiaries where you get to do everything and your path is going to be a lot quicker to that next role. Mm -hmm. And you'll get to find out what you like too. Exactly. So at the smaller the league, smaller the franchise, smaller the team, you'll wear multiple hats, but then you'll be like, you know what? I really love day game operations. I really love, you know, sponsorship sales, or I really, like, I can see this. And then, as I said, you know, glom on, buddy up, and find that thing. And you'll find a lot of people are very willing to help, I think, but those, that's a great You gotta idea. show them you're helpable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would also say, I would add, uh, in addition to what I've heard up here, I would also add, um, look for those mentors. Look for those people that will help you as your career grows. But you have to earn that person's respect. You, you get nothing on day one until you start to earn people's respect around you. And it's not easy. You've got to take that crappy position, sometimes emptying, emptying the trash in the concourse, sweeping, whatever it might be. If you're passionate for it, you'll get over those hurdles fairly quickly and your management team will see that you are reliable, dependable, and you know, you'll start to get promotions fairly quickly. And more importantly, you'll get a good reputation within the industry as a person that rolls up their sleeves and gets it done. Similarly to what Charlie said, um, I live under the adage that uh, live entertainment never takes a day off. So therefore, neither can I. Uh, my wife and I were in the Bahamas last week for a week's vacation, but I worked in the hotel room four hours a day because it's what's required. Um, the team needs to move on, and simply because you're on vacation doesn't mean your team can halt, right? There's still work to be done. Um, Easter Sunday games, I was on the phone Easter Sunday for three or four hours solving a problem with a particular client. You don't know when those emergencies come, uh, but you can depend that they will come at the least opportune time. Um, so I leave it at that. Great answer. So please help me thank this wonderful panel for coming to Johnson Wells today. <laughs> Jama, Michael, Charlie, Dan. A tremendous amount of uh, industry uh, experience up here. Uh, we do ha have to do a few photos, uh, but I will let the, I'm sure they'll hang around for a few minutes if some of you want to do one-on-ones. Again, this is a chance for you to meet somebody that could possibly help you in the future, uh, so take advantage of it. Uh, thank you for coming today, and uh, we'll see you in class. Thanks, Lee.